uh, where I'm based, at Australian Catholic University, which is um, actually, uh, we like to say it's Australia's only national university and that Australian National University is actually only in Canberra. Um, we have uh, six campuses across five states and territories in Australia and I'm based at the um, Melbourne campus in Fitzroy where I lead the Early Childhood Futures Research Program and it's a real privilege to be here tonight so thank you Monica Maria for inviting me to uh, speak with you. Uh, when we planned this uh, talk some time ago uh, and I was involved in the um, work on the advisory group uh, we weren't quite sure when the report would be out, and I said, okay, well, I'll have this one up my sleeve. I'll talk about induction and mentoring. And uh, I, I can see it's pulled a crowd, so that's good. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm really happy to also talk about the advisory group report, and I'll, I'll touch on it in my presentation, and, and I'm very happy to answer questions. Um, I'm also happy to respond to questions as we go along. Um, if there's a burning question or a point of clarification that you want me to touch on. But basically what I want to do is move through the front end of my presentation quite quickly to get to the juicy stuff at the back end, which is actually talking about what it's like trying to get registered in an early childhood <coughs> centre in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and I've called it a continuing challenge. So just by way of background, this uh, the work that I'm talking about tonight comes out of a project that was funded by the Teachers' Council, and this is how you know it's historic, because the Teachers' Council doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> um, and I wasn't quite sure uh, on the opening slide, you know, which logo should I use? Should I have Education Council? Or I couldn't actually find a Teachers' Council one. Um, <clears throat> but the team um, was actually uh, led by Jenny Watman at NZCR. Jenny's uh, now based in Auckland, still working for NZCR, myself, and Professor Andrea Nolan from Deakin University in Melbourne. I want to acknowledge those colleagues um, that made up the research team. And basically what the Teachers Council asked us to do, I'm not going to make you put your hand up if you know what I'm talking about. You know there's the registered teacher criteria, right? Hold that thought. Mm -hmm. There's also this other thing called the guidelines, it was referred to as the guidelines, the guidelines for induction and mentoring and mentor teachers. And these were put out in 2011, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the rationale behind them, why the Teachers Council developed them and so on. But what the Teachers Council asked us to investigate was how effective are these guidelines. And the obvious place to start is, well, has anybody heard of them? Do they use them? You know, those kinds of things. And we actually started in that place. And then if they have heard of them and they are using them, how are they using them? And if they are using them, is it making any difference? So this is actually a really complex study of practice distributed across, you know, all the schools and early childhood services in New Zealand. As I said, it was a three-year project, so the data, when I present some of the data tonight, bear in mind that I'm now speaking back two or three years to the data. It may have changed, may have got worse, I don't know. Mm. Uh, it's an empirical question. Um, we did multiple surveys of PRTs and mentors. So every year, a survey went out to every PRT in the country and to every provisionally registered teacher, first and second years and to every mentor teach. And the first problem is that there are no databases of these people, believe it or not. We know, uh, Teachers Council knew where the, regist the provisionally registered teachers were because they had to fill in the form and send in their details. But um, mentors are much harder to, to get to and so the PRT survey said, please tell your mentor that there's a survey for them. Um, despite that, we actually had quite a good uptake we also did um, over 20 case study sites, schools, secondary and primary, and early childhood services. Most of the case studies were early childhood, and I'll explain why in a minute. And we went back several times. And when we were there, we sat in on induction meetings, we sat in on uh, classroom feedback sessions, we sat in on staff meetings, and we interviewed PRTs and mentor teachers. And we also, we took photographs, we observed what was going on, and we collected artefacts. So we've now got this huge data set of photographs and scanned images of um, induction policies, 
of all kinds of portfolio documents that uh, beginning teachers were using to um, generate their evidence for meeting the, the um, RTC. I'm going to talk an acronym tonight. Um, and so um, some of what I'm going to present tonight comes out of that data set. I'm not going to present a lot of conclusions tonight. What I want to do is open up some questions around this idea of the continuing challenge. Um, don't, for the non-academics in the audience, don't worry too much about the definitions. I just want to make the point, again, this is a very large and complex study, and we use three main methodological approaches. The first is what's called program logic. And program logic is where you sit down with the person who's funding the research. In this case, we sat down with the staff of the Teachers Council, including the CEO and the people responsible for early childhood in particular. And we ask them to describe to us how induction and mentoring should work from the point of view of the Teachers Council. In an ideal world, what happens? And you map it. And so you start with, right at the start, that there are actually valid criteria. That's a good place to start. And then you have things like, you know, every PRT will have a copy of the guidelines and of the RTC. And every mentor will have a copy of the guidelines and, and that everybody will know where to find the website. And everybody, so you actually map how the program should work if it's working in the optimal way. And then of course we go out and find how is it actually working and map it against the ideal world. So that's how program logic works. Activity theory is more about understanding how people get their, the work done. In this case, the work of induction and mentoring what's actually going on in the real world as people work together on this issue of getting people registered and all the tasks <coughs> that go with that. And so we were interested in the kinds of cultural practices, and I don't mean cultural in the sense of tikanga minare or te, you know, māori, I'm talking about everyday culture, how we do things around here. What is the culture of mentoring in the school? And as I said, we had these large surveys. Now, surveys are always uh, dependent, or the kind of surveys we did, online surveys, they're dependent on self-report. And so people report on how they think they're experiencing induction. Um, and, uh, you know, you can get a sampling bias. People who are really unhappy about their induction and mentoring may be more disposed to answer the survey or indeed maybe less disposed. I'll talk a little bit about the survey responses, but I'm just saying that to say that they're, they're pretty loosey-goosey, really. That's a technical term we researchers like to use. Um, they're indicative rather than um, set in concrete. But before I do that, I just want to say a couple of things about uh, some normative assumptions about induction and mentoring in early childhood in this country. Now again, this is the context of a couple of years ago. That teacher registration isn't compulsory, except that the profession for quite a long time has been self-regulating. And this is one of the characteristics of the field in New Zealand, is that the profession has tended to move ahead of the policy. Um, so for a long time, and I know you talk about education and care centres, but I am distinguishing here quite deliberately between kindergarten and childcare, and that's an issue I'll come back to, which I don't, probably don't need to, because you all know what I'm going to say, don't you? But it's really tough if you're in childcare. Um, so kindergarten teachers are required to be registered. And because there's always been a system of senior teachers, K3s, they were back in the day, um, who were available to, and as part of their role, to foster professional learning. There was an inbuilt structure that the induction and mentoring system could be mapped onto, and that wasn't the case in other services. Just before we started the work, the government pulled the plug on funding to support induction and mentoring in early childhood. Um, primary PRTs in their first, or primary and secondary school PRTs in their first year of teaching are on a 0.8 load with 0.2 for induction and mentoring and 0.9 in year two. When you think about the number of new teachers going into schools, that's really, really expensive. I don't know why the funding got pulled. Somebody might know the answer in the 
Um, what I was told, not enough mentors, sorry? Yeah. 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 When I was a, um, I started out as a primary teacher before I worked in childcare, and and uh, my, my point too, and my first year was used for reading recovery. I had no induction and mentoring, which explains a lot, frankly. Um, <laughs> the lack of registered teachers in childcare. I'm not even going to gloss that. Anyway. What does this lead us to? The assumption that induction and mentoring is difficult in early childhood. So part of the thinking that came out of the program logic was that we should do more case studies. So of the 20 or so case studies, nine of them were in early childhood services and a, and a, a variety of types of service as well. And I'm going to draw um, on some of that data tonight. Okay. I'm going to move really quickly through this. I'm happy to talk about it in more detail over a cocktail. <laughs> yeah, I'm standing between you and a Chardonnay, so I'll keep moving. OK. <laughs> I have to remember this is being recorded. <laughs> um, that during the period of the study, um, so this is across a three-year period, 12, 13, 14, that the number of PRTs um, getting access to induction and mentoring did improve. So the number without access declined. So by um, towards the end of um, 2014, only 8% of PRTs who responded to the survey um, were not getting um, ac access to induction and mentoring. And we don't know how many of those people were casual relief staff, for example. We did ask them. You know, were they in a continuing position? Induction and mentoring policies, um, non-existent in a lot of places, or they were unclear, they were sort of rolled up in the professional development and appraisal, PDNA, it's called the schools in Australia, I don't know what it's called here. Um, or they were wrapped up in just more general professional learning policies. Um, Schools and early childhood services, we found that typically where there was mentoring going on, it was a supportive environment. That's what PRTs told us, that it was supported. But the best support happens in primary. Again, it's probably not a great shock to you, but um, there are more proportionately more unsupported beginning teachers in early childhood and in secondary schools. Primary principles big variable here, this leadership in the school. And as you can imagine, there's a kind of a, a, a wrap-up effect here where there's a strong principle, you'll get good policy and you'll get good systems. So, um, you know, there's, there's a certain, um, trying to find the right, well, I was going to say luck, it's not luck, but some PRTs find themselves in a highly conducive induction and mentoring setting and some don't. In terms of formal and informal support, because I've talked about the formal support that we observed in the case study, so sitting in on induction meetings and so on, but a lot of induction and mentoring is informal. Staff room conversations, conversations in passing in the corridor or, or in the room. Um, I think this is interesting that, that uh, less than half of the respondents said that their program was formal and structured. More than half in secondary, but way low in compared in early childhood. So only 44% felt that they had a formal structured program. Now again, given the resources available, that's probably not surprising. Um, we found when we took that the, the insights from the survey out into the case study work, that where people uh, would describe their, in the survey they might have said that their induction and mentoring was informal and flexible, what it could actually look like was that it was just really haphazard. That because there was no planning, and often it was the responsibility of the PRT to drive it, which is actually important up to a point. Um, there were schools and early childhood services providing um, ongoing support in formal and informal ways, and some not providing support. 
And then a group in the middle where things were sort of a bit wobbly, not ideal. That wobbliness was most likely to be found in early childhood services. So you see how there's a kind of consistent thread through here of a, of a kind of unevenness. Getting to the nub of the study about how they were using the guidelines, we found that mentors were more accustomed, more familiar with the guidelines than PRTs, and that kind of puzzled us because we knew, you know, the Teachers' Council does its roadshow to graduating students and everybody gets a copy of the RTC. I think that my take on that as a teacher educator is that, um, you know, when you're poised to go out into your first teaching position and you've got someone from the Teachers' Council showing you booklets or websites, the relevance of it actually, it's not real until you're actually in the context where that tool will be called upon to be used. One of the ECE um, provisionally registered teachers said, this is a kind of a caveat to what I'm saying. It would be wonderful if the mentors fully engaged with the guidelines. I bring them into discussion, but I'm not sure my mentor refers to them. Now, I included that quote because the point I want to make is it's one thing to say the mentors are familiar with the guidelines. It's another thing to say that they are actively mobilising them in the induction and mentoring process. Um, we did have, I just have to share this one principle when we said, um, do you have a copy of the guidelines in the school? He said, I'm sure we do, started shuffling on his desk, what colour is it? Um, now that actually reflects the amount of stuff coming onto principal's desks. So we're talking about the lived culture of schools and early childhood settings. So if we go back to the idea of the program logic model, this is how ideally it would happen as a policy and practice process. And then there's the real world of what was actually happening. Now, to be fair to the Teachers Council, a great deal of what we found confirmed what they already knew or suspected. And the point of doing the research was to try and find the points where they could enhance what they were doing. The lowest reported usage of the guidelines was in secondary schools. And again, you know, this such structural differences between primary schools and secondary schools, the way that teams are formed, the kinds of responsibilities. Some of the big secondary schools in Auckland where we had case studies, you know, there would be senior staff who would have 15 PRTs to mentor. You know, if you've got 200 staff, 15 PRTs isn't even 10% of your staff. So, yeah, that's not surprising. But that's an awful lot of induction and mentoring activities going on. This is where the rubber hit the road, the registered teacher criteria. Everybody knows about these, and why do they know about these? We found that it was about compliance, actually. That um, there was strong awareness of using the criteria in the induction and mentoring process, often independently of using the guidelines. And in fact, they are a really useful tool. If that's where you're trying to get to, why wouldn't you have them in the induction and mentoring meeting? Early childhood PRTs tended to be more developmental in their orientation towards the criteria. RTCs in schools tended to see it as another kind of assessment exercise that you need to you know, achieve, get those things marked off. Again, there are cultural reasons why that may be the case. Um, there's an awful lot of assessment and feedback activities going on in schools. What we found in the case studies was that largely it was about compliance, that the RTC, although in early childhood they might be used developmentally, that that wasn't really their main, their main use. So of course for us, given that the project wasn't about the criteria, it was about the guidelines, we had to ask ourselves, what is the relationship between the two? And if push comes to shove, if it's between the guidelines and the criteria, the criteria are always going to come through because you get what you inspect, not what you expect. The other <coughs> thing that we found is that in a practice of, I guess, efficiency, given how extraordinarily busy early childhood services and schools are, that we found that induction and mentoring was tending to sit 
not developmentally or not in terms of appraisal, but somewhere in the middle, that people were using the process of induction and mentoring as the annual appraisal process. Now, in some ways that's heartbreaking, and in other ways it's really smart. Give the same feedback twice? Why not? So, you know, this reflects, I think, the tremendous pragmatism of busy teachers. The question I would raise is how does that position induction and mentoring as a cultural practice? And is it actually developmental? Is it assessment of or is it assessment for? And is it assessment? So that's an open question for us, the extent to which, for the, for the research team, the extent to which induction and mentoring is a kind of um, surveillance and management um, process, as opposed to a develop or, or and a developmental process. Okay, let's get to some interesting stuff. I'm going to just let you read this, and then I'm going to ask you what you think. Oh, actually, I'll read it out because it's being recorded. <laughs> the PRT said that both she and her mentor know beforehand when meetings will be and what will be talked about. The mentor sends out an email two months before the meeting with all the paperwork and includes forms for other teachers to reflect on the PRT's practice. These are all early childhood cases, by the way. The PRT goes to meetings knowing what to expect and finds that very helpful. All PRTs indicated gratitude for the mentor's professional leadership, saying that she's fair, supportive and helpful. No problems were expressed about her mentorship. The guidelines were on the mentor's desk, but not used today. She said she had used them twice to write the centre policy on support for PRTs. The PRTs in the centre were not familiar with the guidelines, but the registered teacher criteria were used frequently. Using appraisal documents that are almost entirely based on the RTC ensures that all the teachers are familiar with the RTC and they're part of the centre discourse as a result. So this is what I mean as an example of using the induction and mentoring process for that dual purpose of appraisal. So, pretty systematic. Everybody knows what's expected. There's plenty of advanced warning. Any other thoughts about that example? Anything that horrifies you or excites you or delights you? What's not clear in this one is how often they're meeting. So, which is an issue I'll come back to in another case study. It also seems so focused on the process and so and, and a kind of a big lack in the more holistic sort of dimensions of a relationship when you're looking at it that would be mental. That's what I was trying to hint at when I said all highly structured. Yeah. So this is an example of and I'm not saying that this is about compliance, but if you want to treat it as a, as compliance, this is a good way to organise yourself. Is that consistent with your yeah. Okay. Here's one that might be close to the hearts of some of you who are working uh, in the field at the moment. All PRTs had one or more portfolios or exercise books or folders in which they collected evidence of their work towards achieving the registered teacher criteria. No time in addition to paid meeting times of two hours per term is provided for PRTs to work on their registration process. Each teacher has, pa has paid non-contact time of one and a half hours per week. Another PRT indicated that today all her registration work is done at home. Centre manager noted that she thought the PRTs were quite stressed about registration, that they think it's extra work on top of everything. She said that it was becoming important for the centres, centre that PRTs become registered. Why are they becoming stressed about it? I mean. This is such a brief glimpse of this scenario, but how does it resonate with you? No time, yeah, yeah. Doing it at home, I think that's, that came through as quite common. I think that what jumped out at me is that the um, process of development towards the registered teacher criteria in this scenario is seen as something separate and additional to daily work. It's not something that's rolled up and embedded. And I'm not talking about embedding the extra work. 
I'm talking about a particular way of thinking about evidence and a particular way of thinking about demonstrating the criteria. And it's a, it's a bit like doing a learning story on the teacher, isn't it? You know, that they has, or that they have to do one on themselves. Okay, third example. The Centre Director explained that funding supplied by the Ministry to support PRTs had been dropped more than a year ago, and this had made a big difference to what her centre could provide for PRTs. While the centre has managed to retain and pay the costs of mentors, their meetings have been reduced from fortnightly to six to eight weekly. In addition, professional development activities and the use of relievers to provide time for PRTs to work on registration matters have been severely curtailed. Now PRTs must use their three hours of non-contact time or work from home to continue their registration work. What jumps out at you out of that one? The paper trail. The paper trail, yeah. We like forms in early childhood. What jumped out at me was that they retain and pay the costs of mentors. The mentors aren't in the centre. There may not be any other registered teachers in the centre. I think there has to be one, doesn't there? Yeah? Does there, does there have to be one under regulation? Sorry. What also jumped out at me is the angst the teacher may have around time they see as precious for pedagogical documentation. Absolutely. An ethical commitment, absolutely. And this activity, if it's used in that non-contact time, is displacing that time, <coughs> meeting with parents, contacting support services to support particular children and families and so forth. Final example. The mentoring activities for this centre were undertaken by independent contractors who charged for their services. Now, in the previous example, this is koha for mentors from other early childhood services. This one is a consultancy basis. The three PRTs in the centre chose a mentor provided by the Community Child Care Association and E, who's one of the PRTs, chose J. And J is a self-employed consultant. She charges $70 an hour for her services. She facilitates meetings and visits between the six PRTs, including E, that she mentors across the city. So she has the uh, PRT, she's supporting PRTs in various services. And she links them into a network of teachers that she helps to facilitate. We had one example, it's not this consultant, but we had an example of one consultant who had 45 PRTs and was meeting them on a monthly basis. There's an awful lot of sharp intake of breath going on, but quite frankly, those PRTs were probably getting <coughs> monthly meetings from someone who was really attuned to them, focused on their needs. I don't know. I, wasn't, I didn't do this particular field work. So the reason I chose these examples was, well, there were two reasons, really. One is to um, is kind of a story of, of despair, really, uh, in, in the sense of here's a field that, again, has had resources pulled away. Um, I, I'm interested in your comment about abuse of the system because I, I didn't hear it put quite as bluntly as that when, when we did the research, but we certainly heard that, um, that the funding actually wasn't being taken up at the rate that the Ministry had expected. Um, and if induction and mentoring isn't going on, then the funding isn't going to be taken up. So it becomes a kind of circular, a circular process. There's probably lots of reasons, as there usually is in these scenarios. Yep, 
Yeah, but the 100% qualified was pulled first. But it politically didn't make sense if the yeah. government was no longer driving towards a 100% qualified workforce. It's nonsensical yeah. for them to continue to fund that. Yeah. It politically wasn't aligned. The point I'm making is that I heard various explanations <laughs> of why the funding was pulled. Clearly, and this is the second point I wanted to make in showing these examples, clearly there is a professional commitment in the field to induction and mentoring. And there are centres that are employing all sort, typical early childhood, I'd have to say, employing all kinds of creative strategies, whether it's employing a consultant or... I actually think more could be done, but before I go on to some uh, questions and some examples, I just want to touch on um, where we went with this in the advisory group report. But before I do, are there any other comments about the case examples that I've shown? Anything that strikes you? Um, I was quite interested in this one. When I came up originally, I was describing it and then the city has been changed. And it's very isolated. I think that's a really important point. You're actually beautifully um, jumping ahead to my last slide. No, that's very, very, very good point. I'm really pleased you brought it up because um, I think there's a question to be raised, what does mentoring look like in the wild? Because what we're seeing here is we ask questions about formal and informal processes. And I think part of the reason that the early childhood educators um, said that, you know, it informal mentoring was more likely to happen was because the early childhood PRTs could spot it. They spotted that informal mentoring was going on. Whereas I think the primary and secondary PRTs, they recognise mentoring as something that happens in a meeting where you sit down with your mentor. Because it has to be organised because otherwise you're by yourself. That's right. Because you're in a single cell classroom and because it's timetabled and so forth, on the other hand, there's an awful lot more non-contact time in schools. So I think it's about how do you spot it and what do you think mentoring is? Can we come back to that question? Because it's a really good one. Can I just ask you, how did you choose the case study centre? Um, we purposively sampled. So we actually drew up a sampling grid of what, a, what an ideal purpose of sample would look like. We wanted to make sure that we had a mixture of private and community um, childcare. And I'll talk about childcare and kindergarten separately because that's how it works um, for, this, for these purposes. Um, so we wanted to make sure we had some community as well as um, privately owned centres. We also were particularly concerned about rural and low SES services. So, for example, we had a centre in Auckland um, with quite a large number of Pacifica staff, which is just awesome. The, um, the director of this, or the, sorry, I'm saying director, it's an Australian word, the supervisor of the centre um, was herself newly registered. And it was a large centre. She had something like 10 PRTs on her staff. She's just registered herself. So it's a really good example of where the capacity is really, really stretched. As soon as you get outside the main metropolitan areas, Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, I should probably just say Auckland, Wellington, you're starting to get really stretched um, for available mentors. Um, I'm old enough to remember when, uh, and I was still in New working in New Zealand, when people in early childhood services were looking for mentors in their local primary schools. I think that's an idea worth revisiting. Um, I'll go on record as saying that. Um, and I'll unpack that if you like. But um, I've forgotten the original question. <laughs> oh, how did we select them? Um, and then we also wanted to get, um, we knew that in the secondary sample we wanted to get some really, really big schools. So having then identified our sampling frame, we then looked at, we went regionally, we talked to the Teachers' Council because they actually know where the PRTs are and they have regular contact. Um, and then we actually cold called. 
we went to, uh, and we piloted all of, we piloted the case study method as well um, on TAME schools and centres that we knew before we went out and cold called. So it was quite an elaborate process. At the core of the guidelines is this concept of educative mentoring. And if there's one slide you take a picture of on your phone, <laughs> which apparently is how people take notes these days. Great. I love it. Um, this one. Good. I'm seeing lots of cameras. Because educative mentoring as a concept is supposed to, this is the, the, really the driver of the guidelines, is supposed to re replace the old advice and guidance system. And a lot of you aren't old enough to remember that there was the system of advice and guidance. And advice and guidance is really about the sort of all-knowing, um, really gruff <laughs> senior teacher who can keep you on the rails, you know, keep you on the right track. Whereas educative mentoring is a much more dialogic process. It's much more about the co-evolution of the mentor and the mentee. It's about developing autonomy and agency in the provisionally registered teacher, but also about increasing autonomy and agency for the mentor. Serious conversations, active listening. This is quite hard work when you're busy. It's so much easier to just tell someone what to do. I know I feel the impulse all the time, I'm doing it to you now. Feedback based on evidence. Now that generates a whole lot of other problems about the mentor, how the mentor generates the evidence with the PRT and what forms of evidence will be valued. That there are goals. It's not a conversation about how do you think you're going? How do you feel you're going? That can be part of the conversation, but it has to be much more, have a lot more momentum in it. And it's about building confidence not building confidence by saying you're doing really well. It's about building confidence through the PRT, feeling that they are more and more expert, that they're getting better and better at the work. I think there's also, um, <clears throat> and this, this advice came directly from the Teachers' Council, that at the system level, so we're now talking at the level of the early childhood field of schools, of secondary schools, as a field of education. Overall, it's about increasing the quotient of good mentoring that's happening out there, of deep reflection that's happening across the system. And shifting the focus to children's learning, thinking about students, there's an awful lot of energy in early childhood services put into maintaining harmony amongst the team so that the other educators, the other teachers become the focus of the work. That was, nobody's challenging me, I'll keep going. Um, and that there's a wider culture of mentoring. You can read this online so you don't have to read this or, or um, I'm, I'm looking at recommendation 10 from the advisory group on early learning. The report's available on the website. You don't have to worry too much about the bump, but if you read the 20 recommendations at the front. Recommendation 10 says that all early childhood education and care services make available teacher inquiry time. See, we didn't call it induction and mentoring, we called it teacher inquiry time. <coughs> equivalent to two hours non-contact time per provisionally registered teacher per week to support inquiry-based induction and mentoring. You can write anything, no, you have to make really realistic. The minister asked us to make practical suggestions. The brief, what will improve the implementation of Te Whariki? and what will foster continuity of learning. Those were the two main foci of our work. And we said, if you want to make the boat go faster, you need to invest in your provisionally registered teachers. 
and I'm quoting directly from the report here, saying that this kind of activity is unevenly distributed across the sector. There's an awful lot of kindergarten teachers who are getting that, but it's not distributed evenly between not-for-profit and for-profit centres. It's not distributed evenly across home-based family daycare, childcare services, long daycare, kindergarten. Many early childhood services already allow time for developmental activities. However, we believe all services should be expected to provide inquiry time for qualified staff. Now, of course, services will say we can't afford it, we don't have the money. But you can see where this is going. This is about leverage in terms of funding. This is about saying, if the government's serious about lifting the game, then the investment needs to happen at the critical point where the graduate teacher hits the teaching world. <clears throat> we also said that centres should be expected to account in their audit return to the Ministry of Education and in self-review processes for how time is used to show that services are directly investing in building teacher and service capacity so that we don't get the you know, that there's actually a direct line of accountability if and when funding is received, that that's what it's being used for. Provisionally registered teachers need time to reflect on practice and their assessment of progress in meeting registered teacher criteria. Inquiry time specifically for induction and mentoring should be additional for PRTs as qualified staff. Now, recommendation nine, which comes just before this, obviously, um, says that every centre should be providing two hours of paid non-contact time per qualified teacher per week for continuing professional development. Not for doing assessments, not for loading the dishwasher, not for doing the roster. There's a lot of very cynical laughter happening in the room at this point, I have to say. But this is, I was gonna say this is aspirational. I actually think this is achievable. And what we're saying is that for PRTs, as qualified staff, they should get their two hours and then they should get another two hours because they're PRTs. They still won't be getting as much as a primary or secondary PRT, because they're only getting half a day. Sorry, I cut you off. No, that's right. Um, the two hours, would that actually have to be used every week? Would that be used for, say, 10 minute day? What a fantastic idea. I love it. See? This is what early childhood people do. Accumulate the time and use it to add all your two hours together so that you could have a day coming to the University of Auckland to a fabulous conference or... Yeah? Okay. So here's what I want to leave you with is this, this issue of a continuing challenge. Um, so here's some questions for you to bat around, to take up, to take up in your professional development conversations, to take up with an initial teacher education, to take up in research. And I think to take up for the Teachers' Council, now education. Aotearoa Education New Zealand, Education Council New Zealand. What creative alternatives might be possible beyond the one mentor, one PRT norm? It's actually quite an old fashioned, high maintenance idea. What about circles of security? What about bringing together groups of PRTs, wine, cheese, and RTCs? There you go, I just gave it a title. How might teacher educators more strongly prepare the driving of the induction and mentoring process? Now, I'm not saying here get stuck into them in the last six months of the three-year degree, and I know your curriculum's already chocker, but actually, what is it about induction and mentoring, particularly the mentoring part, that can be back-mapped into the whole of the early childhood degree? so that people who graduate are disposed towards peer mentoring, being mentored, they know what mentoring means. What might that look like? How many students understand that when their associate teacher or when their lecturer 
is counselling or coaching them, that they're also mentoring them. And I know there are different definitions of mentoring. Do they understand the difference between a mentor and a role model, for example? What strategies are available for just-in-time learning? I think there's probably quite a lot of this going on in early childhood services because of that high level of informal mentoring, where people are work, work, working and someone's coming up to them and saying, have you thought of doing it like this? Or tell me about what you're doing here. Or, you know, that's, scribble that down because that could go into your portfolio. That's, that's a really nice example of... And I just thought I'd just chuck in a couple of, because I like to stir, I'd chuck in a couple of big questions. What's the difference between focusing on relationships and focusing on practice? Um, early childhood is, education is the practice of relationships. So please don't understand me as somehow seeing those things as separate. But do we understand that in forming, you know, we form relationships for something. What are they for? We're good at forming relationships. What um, some recent work coming out of Massey has suggested is that in some centres, particularly with babies, that's where it stops. So it's lovely, it's warm, it's tuned. It's probably a bit dull. You know, it's nice. What, what, what do we want to say about the practice that's going on in that context? And I'm not saying don't pay attention to relationships. You can't do anything with practice, with teaching and learning, until you've got a handle on the relationships. Going back to the point about induction and mentoring needing to focus on goals, I'm raising the question, and this is a question for me as a researcher and teacher educator. I've been trying to solve the same problem for 20 years, so I'm probably not the right person to ask. But does the field have sufficiently well-articulated goals? or developments in pedagogy. Do we know enough about what early childhood teaching looks like, should look like, could look like, to be able to say, Rachel, you're really going well with this. You know, we're, I think we should take this now. I think the next development, your zone of proximal development, I reckon you should head in this direction. I think in your work with the babies tomorrow, I'd like to see you you know, pushing. Yes? Do we actually have well enough articulated goals in terms of enhancing? Because we know what good teachers look like when we spot them. But can we actually back map that to say how they got there and then mentor somebody else to do it? I'll just leave that with you. <laughs> it's a big question. Thanks, everyone. Kia ora. Okay, uh, thanks, Joss, for a very inspiring and aspirational. Well, yeah, slightly depressing, but um, I think lots of ideas here too for going forward. And um, I've got a whole bunch of questions, uh, but I'm not going to ask because I think there's a whole bunch of people out here that probably should talk more than myself. And so um, email me, you know, yeah. if you want to continue the conversation, get in touch. Yeah. And I really like the questions you had up just at the Good. end there. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if people would like to focus on those or whether you've got your own burning questions, comments, um, kick off some discussion. We thought we'd probably go for another 10, 15 minutes um, with some discussion. So. Yeah. I'll open it up. Over here and then Jean. Um, yeah, I just wondered if um, you could tell us exactly what is expected um, of people that don't meet the criteria within the set plan that they have all this unpromised messages. I've heard that they have to do a four month course and they've got to do assignments and they have to pay four thousand dollars. I don't work for education. <laughs> Council New Zealand, so I'm probably not the right person to answer. I don't even live in the country, so I'm probably not the right person no, to... But what I would say, and I should have mentioned this in the presentation, is that if you work in early childhood, you're much more likely to not be registered within the first two years. So 
Approximately a third of early childhood graduates working in the field will not be registered at the end of the second year. Um, and so the Teachers Council really wanted to know why are people, they call it rolling over, why are people rolling over their registration? And so I don't know what happens to those people. I think if you want an authoritative answer, go to the Education Council website because thems makes the rules. Deborah wants for yeah, and Deborah would Deborah would be able to tell you for sure. Deborah Lugo, Wandsborough, W A N S. Thank you. Jean, I just wanted to um, comment on the last two questions, and I'm thinking of the ERO report that came out, and it certainly found that relationships in the sense of general well-being across the field—that's wonderful, love and kisses. But what is the difference in the relationships in terms of? children's communication and exploration. So I think that that ERO report has been really useful. And the other thing is, the last one, I think again, ERO found that it's just, we're just not articulating goals for, I'm thinking children up to three um, in pedagogy. That's yeah, I'm talking about and goals for the teacher to develop yeah. their pedagogy. Yeah. I'm just gonna make a plug here. These, these documents got mentioned in, in the um, AJO report as well. Um, on the Aero website, you can download their indicators that they use when they go into services for their um, external reviews. And you know, we can get into a debate about you know outcomes and indicators. And I'm aware that there's been a healthy debate about that, and it continues here already. That said, in the absence of other resources, I do recommend them as a starting point. The ones that were done for call hunger. We love them on the advisory group. They actually get right down to the level of explaining to unqualified... The other thing I think um, Massey at the University are doing, Karen Aspen and yes. others, are doing some very interesting um, research on collecting data of teacher strategies. Yeah. Uh, and teachers, what, what interested me in their presentation at the Early Childhood Convention was that teachers don't realise they're doing I know. hundreds <laughs> of things. Yes. And, and so the data is capturing that. Yes, yeah, I call it, um, well, Anne Edwards actually at Oxford calls it core expertise. So if you go to a speech pathologist or you go to a social worker and you say, what is your core expertise? What are the core practices of your profession and, and you know, what do you bring to a conversation about this child? Ask a hospital play specialist, ask a GP, ask a, and they go, blah, 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 blah. ask an early childhood teacher. I help children learn through play. <laughs> and how do you do that? Now, it's not that you don't do it, you do do it, but I don't think we've worked out a lexicon for it in early childhood. Um, that where we can actually say in an interdisciplinary meeting, I'm the early childhood educator here and the expertise I bring is this. I'm highly attuned to typical development and I know how to observe children very closely. I know how to have sensitive conversations with vulnerable parents. We know we can do this, but I, I think we're not in the habit of naming it in that way. Particularly with under twos. Or Particularly under with under twos. And, yeah. and the data is going to come through Thank shortly you. from Massey on that, which yeah. is going to be very interesting. Some of it's hit the press already. Go <laughs> ahead. Who strongly committed to 
everybody here learns, everybody here develops, everybody here is allowed to fail, everybody's allowed to make mistakes, everybody's allowed to be vulnerable. So you, you actually create a culture that's about, I hate this phrase, continuous improvement, but the development, really focused, back to that earlier slide, focused on children's learning. And when I say learning, please understand that I'm not talking about literacy, numeracy, science. I, I'm talking about learning in the most holistic way. When a child learns to walk, is that learning or development? Yes, it is. It's learning and development. But do you as an early child and teacher, are you able to observe that child and see that they're nearly walking? and know which practices to use to get them to take that first step and then have the ethical nous to not tell the parents that they took their first step. <laughs> <laughs> this is really complex work. So yes, we did see educative mentoring, but not at the rates we would hope. That said, the guidelines were only a couple of years old when we, when we were out there. Question in the middle? No? <laughs> right there. Um, I was actually just thinking about your first question there about your creative alternatives. And did you come across anything that you did find was not the norm? Or was it, is it just always seen one thing for? We were really surprised by the kids that led with consultancy going on in early childhood. That was a that was something that we came across. Not just that there were consultants working in the one-to-one -one model, but they tend to also, I mean, these consultants understand that beginning teachers need a network of other beginning teachers, and that often it's safer to express your struggles to peers than it is to go up the chain in the centre. Um, and so that, that was a surprise. I, I guess we hadn't thought that we would see that going on and to the extent that we did. In schools, um, tremendous amount of collaborative, you know, me measuring of groups of um, beginning teachers brought together. They might have, you know, just a one hour. I mean, schools, they just have so many meetings after school. Every teacher every day seems to have a meeting after school. But for the PRTs, bringing them together for an hour a week on a Thursday at four o'clock and doing a hot button conversation around classroom behaviour management or autism or, you know, so actually having those um, formal opportunities. I wonder um, if we can't make better use in the field in early childhood of online sources of that kind of information where people can log on, get that kind of input, particularly in rural areas. Mm -hmm. Where the, you know, because the opportunity cost, if, if you work in a port key and your nearest PD is in Auckland, then the, the opportunity cost of the time you spend in a car, where you could be logging on, with, not just by yourself, but with two or three mates from centres, you know, in the bay, <coughs> having a, a drink and a conversation about it afterwards. I think there's not enough collaboration going on that horizontal way. I even feel that it's the same as when you're in a centre, you almost, when you have meetings with your PRTs, you're one on one with that instead of maybe getting your four or three PRTs together yeah. and have those conversations together. Well, what about getting the four of them together without you <laughs> and they have a conversation about what they need and what they want to take up with you, so that, you know, the element of surprise is on you now, not on me. <laughs> <laughs> Question or comment? Was the data um, kept um, in relation to what you found towards um, salary versus hourly rate? Because I wondered whether um, that changed people's no. perspectives. We didn't ask them how much they were paid. No, not how much they were paid, but whether they were on the salary or they were working on an hourly rate. No, we didn't ask them anything other than time available. Good question. We did ask them if they were in a full-time continuing position, part-time continuing, <coughs> casual, you know, we asked them about it. Just from a money perspective, when I was on the salary, the amount of work that people did home or with lecture um, was different, the mindset around it was different than what I discovered even on the course centre. Um, because they get paid now, they're ready. Yeah. Which is great, 
have to be able to turn it off. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah, that reflection and, and release time. Is that point eight time in primary? That those two days. That was very little of that time was used for reflection or anything like that. It was. Yeah. Hmm. It, yeah, I'm not saying that it's, it's ideal in. Um, that's really why I'm raising these questions. I'm not saying it's ideal because they have point two release time. It's got to be more than that. It's not just about time, it's just about time, which was my point earlier about the, the, the recommendation about non contact time. I think, um, just actually going back to that point about funding, we know, and it's the same in Australia, the rapid growth of um, for profit <coughs> services means that there are a lot of services where their income, you still call it bulk funding here? Where income, and you know, fees from parents are not just paying staff and, and dispersing you know, your everyday consumables and so on, but they're also servicing capital because the centre owner has a mortgage to buy the land and build the centre. Um, and so it's there's a community based service down the road that you know, might be operating out of a tin shed but actually has no debt then you get a whole different pricing structure in terms of the staffing. So, you know, there are bigger questions around how the money goes around. I just have to say that. I know I'm amongst friends. No, I don't remember that. Go on, Charlotte. Um, when you looked at the just-in-time learning and feedback, did the mentors who were outside of the centre um, Some did and some didn't. Yeah. So I'm just wondering what happens if the, if the PRT um, you know, thinks that they're doing something and, and yeah. yeah, all of them, all of the people who were coming from outside would have a conversation with the centre supervisor or head teacher. Because, um, and we know this from work with uh, pre service students in initial teacher education that um, as a lecturer you can go in and watch the student for an hour and then write a report. Unless they're in serious trouble, they'll probably be pretty hot dang during that hour. You're actually going to get a more consistent perspective from their supervising teacher who's there day after day observing them. Um, and so input from the, um, and often it's, it's the centre supervisor or head teacher who's going to sign off on the, and not the consultant, who's going to sign off. They're using the consultant because they themselves don't have the time or capacity to run the induction and mentoring programme. Some of them though did come in and watch teaching in action and then have a, an immediate sort of critical incident kind of conversation. That's one model of professional learning and feedback. I think we've got time for another one, one or two questions. Am I hogging? You go ahead. Sorry, I'm hogging. Go for it, Jen. Um, <laughs> in the 20 recommendations, I think it was 10, perhaps 9, um, there was a recommendation of two hours for teacher inquiry. Something that just popped into my head is how is that going to be, for want of a better word, supervised, monitored? Um, well, that's what we included the audit requirement. Yeah. No, that was with the PRTs. You also, didn't you say that there was one for PRTs, two hours, but there was the other recommendation, was it nine, that was two hours a week for staff, yeah. for teacher yeah. inquiries. Two hours for staff, but you'll see in the commentary in the report that, right. that that's, a, that's a section yeah. in the report and that's rolled up in ministry audit. Because that yeah. money for professional learning is being used for professional learning. One of the things that worries me is that then somebody has to supervise, make sure that they fill in the audit trail, etc. and then that's all No, 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 it's the audit that's already returned to the ministry. It's not a new technology. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. No. But again, I still have a little antenna, you know, is that two hours going to be used? I love the idea of it being um, rolled together and taking a day because then it's so much easier to account for that time.
I don't know. The question was about when the provisionally registered teachers can become registered if they're working in home based services. Yes, I wonder how the provisionally the house teachers who who um, oversee home based educators are registered teachers. Yeah, they would actually be licensed. Yes, that's correct. But you're talking about the caregivers in the home. Question at the back? Comment? Can I um, pick up on your um, your creative um, sort of imperative towards the end there? You know, there's opportunities <coughs> that may exist now to be creative instead of you know, uh, following through. Um, I'm thinking actually also about some of the things that are going on between as a, um, early childhood and primary as possibilities, those transition spaces that... Absolutely. Really Couldn't good. agree more. Um, you mentioned it actually in a sense mm -hmm. of the primary coming down to early childhood. Um, I want to draw attention to a small revolution that's uh, occurring for primary teachers and that they're desperate to understand things at the moment, like what do you do in a room that has three teachers in it and 45 children? What do you do uh, when you start believing in kids? I'm going to take a lot of loudly slogans. Um, and then what do you do with our actions where you're following their interests and you're not using claim tables and you've got rid of um, all these things. Now this is this movement known as modern learning environments or innovative learning environments in New Zealand. We've spent about $520 million just in a couple of years repurposing yeah. all the rooms. Yeah. Um, most people that I've spoken to see it as a building change. They get to understand it as a pedagogical change. So some of those things around the complexity of the party and the things that in a sense are a different problem to early childhood in the way you expressed it as tensions between relationships and now really push the, the teaching, learning and relationships sort of thing. They're oh, reversed a, the, reverse yeah. the other. So I'm wondering whether this leadership mentoring is also I'll have to do a, a, a different presentation sometime <laughs> on, on the work that we're doing in Melbourne around exactly that question of, of um, that, uh, that relationship. But um, I commend the advisory group report to you because in the end we talk about push-up curriculum and, yeah, and we talk about um, the numbers of children who are starting school who need, really need to be in a play-based environment and that um, Already schools are legally are able to use Tapariki with children up to the age of six. Um, and one of the other recommendations that we made is that the, um, that the government remove the requirement on principals to uh, enrol children uh, who rock up on their fifth birthday. Um, not to say that we that legislate for a fixed start date or cohort entry, but to simply take away that so that local communities can decide do we want to take children one by one or do we want to take them at four entry points or do we want to take them at two or one entry point or um, do we want to do both, have a mixture. And that then allows the um, teacher in the new entrant <coughs> classroom to start with a group of children, then another group of children. Um, I think one of the things that happens with individual children starting is they're so psyched about how school is going to be different. And if they get there and it's play-based, it's incredibly disappointing. So <laughs> I think there's a whole lot of issues to be worked through. And I, you know, I commend Sue Dockett's work as well. Around.